Welcome back, everyone. And thank you, Matt Craniac, for coming out today and joining us. Matt is the executive editor of Consequence Magazine. Um, and I'm really curious about this magazine, and I'm so excited that he's here today. So thanks so much, Matt. Yeah, thank you for having me. So um, let's jump right in. And can you tell me, so the the site is Consequence Forum, and there, I had some confusion about this. So can you tell us what is the difference between Consequence Forum and Consequence Magazine? Yeah, so, uh, and, and you're, uh, I'm happy to address that because you're certainly <laughs> not the only one. Um, and it's something that we're, we're kind of going through. So uh, Consequence uh, Magazine started in 2008 with a, a gentleman named George Kovach, who was a Vietnam vet, and not to get too far into the, to his story, but basically when he returned from Vietnam, uh, like many vets, like my father who, was a, who served in Vietnam, returned and, and had some wounds that, that weren't visible, right? PTSD, things like that. Uh, and after working in uh, business, uh, for a number of years, he, you know, he wrote poetry and he found the arts to be uh, therapeutic, went to uh, UMass Boston um, and he got his MFA and he also had got his MA. Um, and long story short, one of the uh, classes run by Askold Menel Menelchuk, who's still a, a, a close friend uh, of the organization, he had uh, for the class it, the assignment was you know create your own literary journal george created one that eventually became more than an academic exercise that was 2008 um and unfortunately george passed in 2020 oh, and at that point that. there yeah he was kind of sudden pancreatic oh. cancer i believe i never met i never met george and by all accounts i work closely with his widow joan who's the the board uh, president and by all accounts, George is you know a wonderful man, and I I, I think he and I would have would have got along uh, uh, you know uh, wonderfully. But so after George passed, uh, there was uh, this idea that consequence was already kind of growing into something larger than than just a magazine. Mm -hmm. um, there had been uh, inroads on it having a video series where there was you know discussions, panels, Q and A's with authors, but also academics and whatnot, um, a website had then started uh, a couple, you know, 2017, I think it's kind of started and, and it was, it existed, we'll say that, you know, they, um, uh, Kat Parnell, who was a, a long time contributor and uh, uh, editor uh, that who helped George, you know, put that together. So there were these kind of basic building blocks already in place for the organization to grow. And so once George passed and they brought me on in November of 2020, there was discussion about, well, how can we make this um, something that can more fully address all of the conversations that are going on about war and geopolitical violence? Because as many of us know, war you know, is example by what's going on right now in Ukraine. It, uh, you know, there's more than just the American experience, right? There's more than just the wars that we are directly involved with. And so we wanted to, to try to capture or at least be a part of more of those conversations. So the mission statement grew. Uh, and so at that point, we realized that we needed to have, be, have a larger umbrella. So to finally kind of get to your question, Consequence Forum is the kind of encapsulation of not only Consequence, it's now called Consequence Journal. Uh, we, from the change, we moved it, for a number of reasons, but one is, you know, I'm sure you know, Becky, a, a magazine, this isn't the only reason, but a magazine is technically something that is produced four times or more a year. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to be true, not only to that, but also because uh, we felt journal had a little bit more kind of uh, heft to it. And so we wanted to kind of stay true to the content uh, of what was going on. Not to say that a magazine can't be intellectual, have intellectual heft. Mm -hmm. It was just a decision that we made. Uh, and then, you know, it also includes um, Consequence Online. We are robust now, we publish at least one or two things a week uh, online. We can get more into that later. Uh, and, now, and now we have Consequence Workshops. Well, our first workshop is coming up. Um, actually, uh, 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 this weekend, it's slated to start. It's a, a veterans uh, writing workshop, but we plan to start doing those more and more. Um, of Consequence, which is a, the video series that started before George's passing, has grown. Um, and there's a number of other community events and activities that kind of uh, uh, don't fall nicely under Consequence Journal, basically. So we have Consequence Form as the organization, and then it has all these kind of 
subdivisions, if you want to call it that, the journal, the online presence, uh, and community events and outreach, things like that. So it's it's kind of the, the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so for the journal, can you just cover the basics and tell us what you seek in submissions, poetry, fiction, nonfiction? And it sounds like you publish four times a year in print and then a couple times a week online. Yeah, so no, we, we actually, we print uh, biannually. So we're twice a year in the fall and uh, the springtime. Um, and then, yeah, online, we, we publish anywhere from one to, to two new pieces. We don't publish too, we don't want to publish too frequently. Uh, online because we want to make sure you know one of the the part of the ethos of uh, consequence consequence forum uh, is to make sure that we're celebrating the contributor as much as possible which is why we pay um, but we want to make sure that when we are, have them in the spotlight we allow the spotlight to kind of be on them for for at least a significant period of time in today's kind of fast-paced world that sometimes means four or five days but um yeah so what we look for you know really is we're after uh, what our mission statement uh, it, it kind of guides us uh, to do, which is that we're looking to address the human consequences and realities of war and geopolitical violence as experienced by combatants, witnesses, and victims. Uh, it's a little bit more than just that, but that's really the kind of nut of it, basically. And so what we look for are, is literary work um, that engages with these issues in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it, it's even though it might sound like it's a very narrow kind of charge focus, um, you know, it, the way that people interpret that and the breadth of experiences that it can, can encompass, you know, we don't ever really have a problem with submissions. We certainly don't have a problem with submissions. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you're addressing uh, our mission statement in some way with your work. Um, and, and that again can come, you know, certainly we get a lot of stories from the combatant perspective, you know, the, the kind of what you would maybe stereotypically think of as a war story, you know, the guy in the jungle, you know, fighting off, you know, the, the quote unquote enemy. Um, but, you know, there's any number of ways it could be interpreted in volume 13, which we put out um, last fall, the, the last story uh, is really a, a, sto a, a, a story, a fiction, fictional story uh, between a love story between two women uh, in uh, Korea, you know, one's a North Korean, one's a South Korean. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be at the foreground, this experience of war and geopolitical violence, it could be in the background. And then from a craft perspective, the, the foregrounded story of, you know, just a, uh, the daily interactions of people and what they're going through while this, uh, you know, the, in the background, like I said, is this kind of war, geopolitical violence, conflict, uh, whatnot, um, is certainly one way that allows us to kind of have a breadth of, of submission. So, um, yeah, so yeah, I think that I think that gets your question. Mm -hmm. And the submission should be literally related to war, like related to a literal war. So for instance, you don't want to see a submission that's someone is at war with their ex-boyfriend or something, where it's like kind of like <laughs> a, um, an experience of war, psychological war, but that's not really what you're looking for. It needs to have some connection to a literal geopolitical event. Yeah, and that's, again, uh, you know, and I really appreciate you asking that, and that's something that, you know, we're continually having to discuss as a staff, mm -hmm. the editorial staff and with the board, uh, and it's never something that is, is easily defined or, I guess, has clear boundaries as yes to this, no to that. Certainly, there are some, you know, there at some point, you know, uh, the story or the poem or the essay uh, doesn't fit our, 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 our uh, mission statement, but um, you know, what it can look like is, you know, it, taking maybe the experience of, of like George or, you know, anybody returning from a war, you know, there doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, gunplay going on in the uh, literary piece in order for it to apply. It can be about somebody who has PTSD and they're dealing with, you know, those effects as they're trying to, you know, whatever literary um, kind of scope you want to get into the day-to-day -day life. Uh, and, and the problems with that, the struggles with that, with the PTSD in the background is certainly one. But yeah, you know, at some point, 
uh, it becomes difficult to kind of distinguish. You know, you get to those uh, the, to the uh, edges of those definitions, and you know that's where work really becomes interesting. For example, after George uh, passed, and we uh, kind of rethought what consequence uh, could be, you know, we added to the mission statement this term geopolitical violence because there's this tendency to think of you know, war in a very, you know, traditional sense. And, and whenever I kind of talk about this, the first thing that always comes to mind are, are those movies where they show like the Revolutionary War and everybody's, mm -hmm. you know, lined up and it's an open field and everybody's with their, you know, their muskets and they're standing, you know, point blank at one another. And if you just look at that, it's like, did nobody think to hide behind a tree or, or whatnot? <laughs> And so I think there's that kind of mentality that kind of continues on when we think of war, we think very much World War I and World War II. And, and as we all know and experience, wars are still fought like that to a degree, but the spectrum now is such, it's so different, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, so on and so forth. There's these gradations now that I think are much more prevalent. And so, you know, trying to be earnest to engage with as many conversations about the nature of war, of geopolitical violence, mm -hmm. kind of necessitated this idea of, well, we need to bring in this other term of geopolitical violence, which simply means political violence with geo uh, with uh, uh, geographical factors in it. So, so, so yes, you know, the, our our pieces can the submissions absolutely should be tied to war in some way or geopolitical violence in some way. But, you know, there, there's an argument to be made that, you know, Black Lives Matter, that that movement is an extension of a geopolitically violent situation, you know, um, slavery, so on and so forth. What's going on at the border, the U.S.-Mexican border, there's a, a geopolitical violent uh, aspect to that, too. So it's something that once you get to the, the, the kind of the, the you know, the, the edges of those ideas and definitions, you know, you start to get into some gray area and then it becomes this kind of, you know, I don't want to say postmodern kind of take on, well, what are we talking, we're talking about, but what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think that there's some interesting kind of conversations to be had there because then we're all kind of thinking about, well, what do we mean when we say war? What do we mean when we say geopolitical violence? Because certainly I would love to talk about like, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade or, 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 or things like that, but that so starts to get a little bit outside of what we're, what we're talking about, because at some point it becomes too diffuse. Um, and and then, then, you know, if you're talking about everything, you're talking about nothing. Um, and we really wanna also honor those people who have had, you know, who are victims, witnesses and combatants of, uh, uh, you know, a war in the traditional sense. We don't wanna kind of equate what they go through to what somebody who is having an entirely different kind of negative experience goes through. So uh, I don't know if that clarified at all, but uh, certainly, yes, you know, uh, the idea is if you believe you have something that, uh, uh, that you think we might be interested in, if you're unsure, you can always email me. I'm very happy to talk, uh, and I often do, with submitters. Hey, is this right? You know, uh, on our website, we have a pretty long uh, uh, frequently asked questions section that, that hopefully kind of delineates some of this stuff. Um, because, yeah, unfortunately, you know, it's not you know, definitive at some point or definitive across the board. There are always kind of these gradations um, that we're always kind of talking about. Well, is this it? Is this it? So. So yeah, thanks for asking, Becky. Yeah, and sort of related to that, do you think that the magazine, do you envision the magazine as having an anti-war perspective or is it, um, or do you try to balance anti-war views with um, maybe people who have very strong patriotic sentiment and have a story about how great it made them feel and how noble to fight in a war? Do you try to balance that or do you feel like the magazine has a specific um, vision that you're putting forward? Yeah, no, and again, another great question. Um, we don't think of ourselves as left or right leaning. We think of ourselves as a humanitarian effort. So we're interested in talking about the conflict or the, the consequences, right? The human consequences uh, of war and geopolitical violence. What that ultimately looks like is that it looks like we are more left-leaning probably than right-leaning. And that's, you know, I mean, the name of the journal 
is consequent. So already we're coming at it that this is a bad thing, but we are we certainly aren't anti-war in the sense that um, you know in, in a way that's kind of outside of our concern. We want to talk about the effects that happen uh, because of it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love, and we've talked, I've talked with my staff about this, to have more, to invite people who are maybe more uh, leaning to the right or, or you know, it, it's, un unfortunately, it's, or not unfortunately, but, you know, it's a, it's a complex question. So even saying somebody who is leaning to the right doesn't necessarily mean that they're pro-war or anything mm -hmm. like that, but that their, their position on conflict might be one that, you know, it is, there are many more legitimate reasons to engage in this kind of behavior. Um, and certainly that is a perspective we would love to have. And we try to cultivate in, in ways when we reach out and, and make announces for like call for submissions and things like that. But I think the nature of, uh, of what we published in the past, and certainly, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about the negative effects of war people tend to think of us as uh, having a very definitive perspective of something close to anti-war. So we don't really get much, you know, from the right side. So that's something we're looking to, to do to change in the future, because, uh, you know, again, as a, a humanitarian effort, and that really is kind of how I think of what we do, we want to have as many voices uh, and many perspectives as possible. You know, um, certainly there's a limit to that. You know, uh, I, I don't think I'm looking for the Oath Keepers to send us any work <laughs> or anything like that. But if, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't be against having a, a heavily moderated panel or mm -hmm. something along those lines so that there could be discussion, you know, among, you know, ultra left or ultra right or, or whatever have you. Because again, what we, we see ourselves are, and this is, Really, something I try to uh, instill in in the staff is that is that we're a rhetorical tool, and, and simply when I say rhetorical, I mean we're a, a device to encourage conversation, communication, debate, thought. You know, there is a hope that somehow this will have an effect somewhere down the road. You know, but the idea is what we can produce is conversation, whether that eventually results in change, you know, that's, that's kind of out of our control. But what I think we can do is have an earnest conversation or attempt to have an earnest conversation that's as holistic as possible, you know, about events that are, you know, um, war based or, you know, geopolitical violence. So it's something we'll continue to look towards in the future. But yeah, for the most part, uh, a lot of the work that we get is about the negative effects of war. Mm -hmm. So kind of, by consequence, it's uh, uh, anti-war in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you guys put out a tweet recently in support of Ukraine. And I, I noticed also on your site, there's stuff, a um, letter from a Ukrainian. Um, and I'm wondering how um, much do you feel a need to weigh in on current events? Um, obviously some are more immediate and in everybody's face and um, some are sort of in the background, but where, when do you decide, like, as a magazine, as an organization, we need to weigh in? Uh, where is this other, you know, because, you know, I could see a situation where you're just weighing in all the time <laughs> because there's oh, something yeah. going on. Um, right. So how do you sort of decide when to hold back and when, you know, you need to sort of take a stand and step forward? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, again, good question. It's, you know, we want to be a part of the conversation as often as we can. But uh, as an organization, we're not designed to be that nimble, right? We're not uh, a, a journalistic enterprise where we have people, quote unquote, on the ground or that we're ready to kind of respond at a moment's notice. You know, we're a largely volunteer staff. We're a literary organization. So um, we don't really have the capability um, to respond uh, minute by minute, such as, you know, any, any organization that has, uh, that has those capabilities. That being said is, you know, we want, like I said, we want to be involved in the conversation. So if we can uh, be a part of it, we will. You know, when uh, we pulled out from Afghanistan, 
you know, that we had a, a couple pieces and uh, that kind of related to that. And, and we tried to engage with that conversation uh, as much as we possibly could. Um, but yeah, it, it's not something that um, we're designed to do. So while we may try to, you know, get a tweet or, you know, some other our other social media platforms such as Facebook and, and Instagram, we'll be able to put something up in response or an acknowledgement, but to to earnestly engage with the complexity of the of the issue and whatnot. It's just not something we can do uh, minute by minute. Um, but uh, um, yeah, yeah. And do you tend to see a lot of submissions around one particular issue all at once? Like, are, are you now getting like a ton of submissions about Russia? And then you mentioned Afghanistan, like does it, does it happen in batches like that? Or, or is what you're reading sort of more diverse? It's more diverse. Um, you know, I think, you know, as a fiction writer myself and as someone who frequently submits, it's, it's you know, the work that I have ready isn't, you know, and I don't necessarily write from a kind of what's happening now perspective, but certainly just kind of thinking about my own process. You know, I, I send work out that is ready, which takes, you know, sometimes a long time to get to a, a publishable place. And so I feel that that's kind of the same thing with the submitters. Uh, two consequence is that they're sending us work that they've been kind of, you know, crafting and, and revising and whatnot. So, um, which is not to say that we don't get some uh, work that it kind of speaks to a, a contemporary moment, but uh, by and large, the work that we get is, is, is talking to, you know, mostly timeless uh, themes, you know, such as, uh, you know, how it affects the family, the, how war affects a, a soldier or a witness or the family or the land or whatever else. Um, so um, it's, it's not, it's not um, as responsive, the submitters aren't as responsive, and that's fine, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a good thing, and also an unfortunate thing, because it just speaks to the breadth yeah. of you know not only the, the 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 trauma and experiences people have had um but uh but yeah you know uh, you know just kind of thought off the top of my head is you know i have uh, my partner uh, you know she has some people who uh some friends who are uh, russian scholars um and you know we're we're trying to you know because we had we had, we had one ukrainian uh, essay uh, posted recently, and actually, we're, I'm going to put up another one here in a couple of days. You know, again, trying to get back to having not necessarily the different sides, because again, these things kind of overlap, and they're not so clear. Mm -hmm. um, because some of these, the the people who are Russian scholars, they aren't you know pro russian necessarily, but they'll provide they can provide a perspective um, that's not from you know a, a Ukrainian perspective or from you know a NATO perspective, whatnot. So. Uh, you know, again, it's it's trying to find a way to engage as many perspectives on a single issue as possible so that more consideration, you know, a more rhetorical efficacy, if you want to get fancy about it, uh, can occur. So, um, so, yeah, we try to respond as timely as possible, but there's just... <laughs> There's too much, there's too many wars, you know, because the ones that even we're talking about aren't, don't even hit on some of the ones that, you know, that, that don't really, you know, unfortunately register in the U.S., you know, because, you know, unfortunately there's, there's anywhere you go, there, there are, there are bad people, you know, trying to take advantage of, of whole country, nation states, communities, so on and so forth, so, yeah. Can you take us into your editorial process? And also, I'm specifically curious because I imagine you guys, more than other magazines, see a lot of really painful submissions. So how do you just personally, do you have to, you know, like go for a walk with every batch of submissions and just get some air? And Because um, I, I imagine what you're seeing is pretty harrowing stuff. So how do you deal with that? Personally, how do you deal with that as a staff? And then just kind of like on a technical level, what is your editorial process? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, after George passed and, and I kind of, I was familiar with Consequence before I came on board, but, you know, after he passed, I kind of re-familiarized uh, myself with, the, with the, the previous 12 issues and kind of looked at it with, with a different set of eyes. 
And that's one thing that you notice is that it's a lot of the work is it's tough to get through. You know, it's not, you know, not that I, anybody sits down and reads a literary journal from front to back. I mean, that's part of the beauty of a literary journal is that you can just pick it up and open to a page and, and, and read something, hopefully get something out of it. But certainly, you know, after one or two pieces, you know, regardless of if it was, you know, a long essay and then a long story or if it was just a, a short poem or something like that. I found that it was tough to kind of want to keep going through and even like a day later to go back to it because I knew what was waiting for me. So one of the things that we kind of shifted a little bit away from is, or let's say not away from, but towards is trying to look at work that maybe doesn't repeat the same kind of tone. You know, um, I, George came from a background, his, his editorial background was very much invested in his personal experience as it should be. Um, but one thing that we were able to do because I don't have, uh, I, I didn't serve and certainly didn't serve. Yeah, I didn't serve was that I, I was thinking of it a little bit more from a reader's perspective uh, in that um, I wanted people to be able to want to come back. You know, if they, if they read a piece, then the next day they would, you know, wouldn't have that kind of dread of, oh, man, I want to read this you know, more in this journal, but it's just I can't emotionally do that. So some of the as far as the editorial process, you know, some of the things that we look for in work is different ways to approach things. Yes, there's always going to be a place for the story for the essay about how your uncle, your aunt, uh, you know, your, your or yourself lost a leg. Uh, has PTSD. Those are tough stories, but they're part of what are uh, tough pieces. Uh, but those, that's part of the experience that we want to try to have uh, include in these conversations. But kind of like the story I was talking about before, you know, is a lot more of a love story that happened to be that the background happened to be uh, the, the war, uh, Korean War. You know that we we are looking for pieces too. That engage with the uh, with our mission statement and our themes in a way that brings uh, a different kind of experience to it. So um, it's not to say that we, uh, again, not that we're not looking for those really emotionally draining stories, but it's something that we're cognizant of. That this is a compendium that we want the readers to engage in the in our work as much as possible because we what we're really after is conversations. So in order to do that, we hopefully are not weighing somebody down, you know, to the point of they don't want to engage at all. We often joke about having a, a humor issue, you know, or something <laughs> along those lines. What that looks like, I have no idea, but I am fascinated. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, but that's what, you know, that's kind of the direction, you know, or at least their, their conversations are always kind of heading back to that. How, how do we bring that necessary levity? Because uh, we don't, we're not looking to make a farce of anything, mm -hmm. but how do we uh, engage tonally with different, well, with how do we engage with different tones so that the conversation has a complexity to it? So, um, and then as far as like the process goes, so, uh, you know, there's no shortage of people that want to help out, you know, thankfully, we're, uh, we're able, we're in a position um, not to get too far into the weeds of our kind of behind the curtain activities, but we're able to pay a number of our editors and, and readers a small monthly stipend. So we were able to expand, you know, we started out, when I came on, there was maybe six of us, six or seven. Our organization is now near the 40 mark. Um, and that includes other branches within the Consequence Forum family that don't have anything to do with editorial stuff, such as grant writers and outreach, social media, stuff like that. But I was able to increase the editorial team to about 20 people. Yeah. And so that allows for people to read without having to suffer through pieces because they're so emotionally draining. We ask our, our readers and our editors for about five hours a week, you know? And so um, I think one of the things that can happen if we aren't very careful of kind of managing workload is that you get burnout because, you know, you, you can only read so many of those stories before you're like, I, you know, I just, I can't do anymore. So. Um, as a mode of preservation within the organization itself, we also, one of the things we do is we try to limit workload, but when we find a piece that we, we really uh, think has potential, 
Um, you know, we often work with the writer to kind of shape it a little bit. You know, I come from a school of thought that hopefully the piece is ready to go, right? Because from the previous journals that I've worked on, you know, there's, it, it, eh, working with writers can be very work intensive. That can be the most time consuming and effort filled uh, part of the process because there's back and forth. There's always the worry that the suggestions that you give a writer will somehow result in the piece taking a left turn for the worse. And then you're really kind of in a quagmire because there's this kind of built in, hey, we're interested and we kind of want to publish you, but now the piece is kind of moving away from being publishable. So it's a tricky balance, but you know, we try to find pieces that are as close to polished and done as possible. Uh, but certainly there's any number of, of essays, poems and stories um, where, where, where we've, we've thought that it's, where it's really solid, but you know, there's some line edits and, and maybe some content uh, level edits that need to occur. And so the editors take it upon themselves to do that, you know, as, 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 as time will allow them because everybody on staff is their teachers or professors or professionals in some other field. And so uh, unfortunately don't have as much time as we all would like to devote to this project called Consequence. So, yeah. Um, we have a question here from Richard. Thanks, Richard. Uh, most journals have more fiction submissions over nonfiction ones. Given the mission of Consequence, I wonder if you get more nonfiction? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Man, do I wish that was the case. <laughs> um, out of, I worked on, you know, three different journals, um, including Gulf Coast, which you know, Becky had a program on a while back. Um, and my experience with all the journals that I've worked on is that nonfiction it just does not get, for any number of reasons, does not get the number of submissions that poetry and fiction do. Poetry and fiction are always, in my, again, my personal experience, at least three times as many. I think, you know, if I'm remembering right, the last time I looked, you know, our, our poetry and uh, fiction were equal. We're around 120. We're about a month into our reading period or so, this reading period, and they're both at about 120. Our nonfiction is at about 30. So it's four times, you know, a quarter of those. Um, and that's after moderately being aggressive with call for subs for nonfiction. I think we advertised in two or three places for that. Um, so yeah, you would think that, you know, Richard, that there would be you know, more people with nonfiction uh, and personal essays, whatnot, uh, that submit. But I, I find that it's about the same uh, as far as uh, uh, the kind of proportion to the poetry and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, and even though, so for volume 13, I had the, well, we had the breakdown of, so we're 160 pages, which really means you know, about, you know, 140 after front and back matter. And then we have an art, uh, eight page art uh, spread that leaves about 140 pages. And last journal, volume 13, uh, we had allotted, I think, 20 or 25 pages for nonfiction. This time we're, we're going 40 across the nonfiction, fiction and poetry. So even though we're not getting as many nonfiction subs, we're uh, giving nonfiction as many pages uh, as poetry and fiction in an effort to, to ramp up, you know, the nonfiction submissions. We want, to, we want to celebrate all forms of literary writing. And I think one of the ways that we can do that is to kind of let people know that we value nonfiction as much as we value fiction and poetry. Um, and so that's one of the ways uh, that we do that. So, so Richard, if you know of any nonfiction writers, if you're a nonfiction writer yourself, send us your stuff. <laughs> Um, we have another question here from Teresa. How do you feel about historical fiction versus contemporary um, and international versus American uh, in balancing? How do you balance um, international versus American in the pieces that you represent? Yeah, no, was, thank you, Teresa. I appreciate that. Yeah, as far as the, the first question in historical versus contemporary fiction, you know, there is... Well, first and foremost, it has to be strong work. You know, that's that's the, the, the if it's not strong work, then it doesn't matter if it's historical or contemporary, if it's an American-based writer or an international writer. But if all things are equal, there's a tendency to lean a little bit towards contemporary, if only because it's a little bit more relatable. 
Um, we had a piece in volume 13, it's called Jim Comes Home from War. And it starts off in the Civil War uh, and then slowly kind of works its way up to, uh, to contemporary to current day. Um, and it was wonderful in its kind of handling of issues that were going on with the Civil War and, and whatnot. Um, and then there's a piece even in this upcoming issue, 14.1, uh, that uh, takes place uh, about 100, 200 years uh, uh, in the past. But both of these examples that I'm talking about, they had relevance, you know, to contemporary issues. So, you know, it, it's something that, again, kind of feeds back to, will the piece generate conversation, sustain, energize a conversation with readers of today, obviously, the readers of today? So if it doesn't do that, you know, if it's a piece about the Civil War that really kind of mires itself, you know, in that time period and of those concerns, then we're less likely to take it uh, uh, than something that is more contemporary. And that's simply because, again, uh, thinking of, our, of ourselves as a rhetorical apparatus, rhetorical tool, uh, uh, a device to create conversation, you know, that piece is less likely to create conversation, in our opinion, than something that's a little bit more contemporary. So it's not that we're against pieces that, that you know, that take place, you know, 50, 100, 200 years ago, but certainly if they are, they, we're looking for work then that somehow relates to what's going on today, which isn't necessarily difficult because loss of life, loss of freedom, you know, that is, that happened obviously 200 years ago, it still happens today. So uh, it, it's not difficult to, to do that, but uh, it is something that we're, we're cognizant of. And then as far as like how we balance, you know, US-based writers versus international writers, you know, we're, we're very fortunate that George was heavy, heavy on translations work. Um, and, and really kind of bringing in the international community because he recognized rightfully so that war is not a purely American experience. Uh, and so uh, because we were so invested in translations and we continue to be, uh, we've always had kind of a, a, a presence in the international community. So again, it doesn't necessarily, those aren't the first criteria we look at. We look at is a strong literary work and then from there, we start to kind of, we'll, we'll, we'll have uh, other priorities. And, and at some point on that list, we get to, well, you know what? We have had four American-based writers, uh, or four, let's say four American-based poets, you know, it is, are there any poetry submissions that we really like that are from somebody outside of the U.S.? And how can we balance that? Because at some point, um, it becomes about the, the right the, the compendium, the, the journal itself as a holistic uh, literary presence. We want to be as highfalutin as that. So we want to make sure as many conversations are involved. And so um, you know, uh, if, if the conversations are uh, are leaning more towards from the US perspective, then let's talk, let's get some perspectives from Africa, from you know, Europe, Asia, uh, South America, things like that. So, yep, literary first and foremost, and then we start to balance things out. Thanks. And are you getting a lot of international Thanks. submissions? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, so, yeah. So, our five major genres, right? Poetry, non, uh, nonfiction, fiction, translations, and then uh, a visual art. The translations, we have a, uh, a feature uh, coming up that focuses on Korea. This will be for uh, issue 14.2, uh, which will uh, come out uh, uh, in the end of the year. Um, you know, because we are actively talking to contributors and, or excuse me, to um, uh, contributing editors, excuse me, I should say, uh, and other people that are in uh, the kind of Asian community, as far as writers are concerned, you know, that's kind of bringing people to us. Um, but because, you know, George has done so much work in the past, because we promote uh, our, our, you know, call for subs for translations, um, you know, we get subs from, from all over the place. Predominantly, yes, they're, they're U.S., US, US or uh, um, uh, Canadian uh, based, North American based. Um, uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but probably over half. Uh, but certainly we, we get a considerable number of uh, European, African, uh, Asian submissions too. 
Um, yeah, I, I can't, again, I don't know the, the top, the numbers off the top of my head, but just like for the last issue that we put out, 13-1, uh, there were, you know, there were say 35 contributors. Um, there was at, at least 10 to 12 that were not based in the U.S. So, and I know that because when I mailed them their contributors copy, I was like, kind of had sticker shock. I mean, you find out <laughs> how much postage is for a single journal to, you know, England. It's like $30. Yeah. What? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned literary merit, and I'm curious because that's always such a complicated issue, but I'm wondering also, given the nature of your magazine, if you see submissions where you feel like, wow, this, the, the literary, the level of prose is not necessarily what you would encounter with like an MFA or PhD person, but this story is essential. This person has something, has an experience that needs to be read by the world. How would you balance um, publishing a story like that against a story where the prose is really excellent um, and that maybe is also strong, um, but you, you know, it doesn't have that authenticity, maybe? Yeah, no, and that's something that we're, we're always kind of talking about. Um, excuse me, you know, coming from uh, the graduate school kind of culture, and it, Becky, as I was telling you, I had like nine straight years of it that I just got out of. So, you know, very much my mind is kind of steeped in, you know, you know, you know, modernism and postmodernism, mm -hmm. and, and these are the kind of you know high literary you know efforts, you know, that that, that play with form and, and that go against expectation and whatnot. So, because we have a more defined uh, mission statement and kind of spectrum of work that we're looking, there's a little bit of a trade-off there, right? So uh, meaning that we are, uh, the content is sometimes supersedes, you know, uh, form, play, or things that you might consider high literary mindedness, uh, whatnot, which is not to say that we're you know, that we completely forget about form and all these other things that, that may be typically associated with literary work. It's just that we have to find that balance a little bit, maybe more so than, you know, uh, than an Agni or, you know, another kind of journal that really just has a, you know, we are literary capital L. So yeah, what we do is we try to, we try to find that balance. So the good thing about, you know, as you kind of were alluding to, you know, literature and what defines literature is a complex question um, and you know the one of the ways that we simplify it I don't think we're overly reductive about it but that is that it, it speaks to something larger and that's what we're really after you know so uh, if a piece has you know a very kind of straightforward you know as fiction goes you know a freight tag diagram is, you know, it's, there's a clear inciting incident and, and oh my, they're relying on plot so much. Who does that anymore? You know, <laughs> we don't, we don't get too caught up in that stuff. And by the way, plot is fine. As long as it's handled appropriately, there's no reason you can't have plot. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're very much concerned about the content as opposed, as opposed to the formal innovation uh, that a, a purely literary organization might be, or a literary journal might be more focused on where they can say, you know what, what they're doing here with, you know, subverting expectations and, and, and all that other stuff, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they can maybe value that a little bit more. So, so yeah, we, we look at work and we are very attentive to craft, to language, to things that, uh, that would probably be easily defined as this is what makes literature, literature. Um, but we're also thinking about, you know, these conversations that we want to have. So if there is a piece that maybe doesn't wow us formally, you know, that's not necessarily out the door. It's, well, what are they saying, you know, and is there any way that we can work with the author to kind of help shape the craft a little bit or, or whatnot. So, uh, but by and large, the people that submit to us, you know, they, they come from a, a, a literary background or, or at least have some literature in their background, even if they've never studied formally. There's any number of combatants uh, uh, that, that send us work that because these people are, either have been writing for a while or because they're, they're lifelong readers, they understand to a degree that that's more than acceptable uh, of how to craft, uh, a, uh, you know, a piece of uh, written expression to a literary level. So, 
again, the, the kind of broad definition is, you know, does this piece, you know, speak to something larger, evoke something, um, uh, an idea, a feeling uh, that is bigger than, you know, some of its parts, basically. So, mm -hmm. so that's what we mean when we say literary merit. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's currently there's uh, the own voices movement um, where, you know, people are sort of encouraged to write in their own voices and kind of stay in their lane. And I'm curious how you approach that. Do you, um, for fiction writers, does the author need to have personally experienced um, time in a war zone or can they just have studied it? Um, how do you balance that? Yeah, it is, it is tricky because you know, we recognize that we, when we publish something, we're in effect kind of giving it the okay. We're saying that this is, uh, this is speaking for consequence or that uh, what it's saying is approved by consequence. Uh, and obviously that can be uh, problematic because we can't research everybody who, whose work we want to publish. We can't dig into their background maybe as much as we like to. Uh, nor necessarily do we want to. Um, and the only reason I say that is because we come up with, you know, a poet with any uh, genre, you know, this idea of authenticity, you know, is, it, you know, if they don't say in their cover letter that they serve, and it's not like the cover letter itself is, you know, some kind of, you know, truthful statement, because, you know, as anybody who's worked on the journal can tell you, People lie all the time on their cover letters. All it takes, you know, people don't realize that Google exists, and all I have to do is kind of type in some things. Isn't it, I actually didn't know that. That's really funny. I didn't realize people were doing that. Oh yeah, no, it, it's and it's but the thing, and not to get too sidetracked, it's you know, yeah. it's you know, if you're gonna lie about it, don't don't say you got published in the Paris Review, right? You know, or something like that. That's really easy to figure out. You know, who's <laughs> been, you know, you know, kind of bury it or, or do something. So it's always funny to me when. You come across people who are clearly their work is is struggling at a very basic level, but yet they have you know this list of you know the Atlantic and the New Yorker. Like, <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah. So it's always us trying to figure out you know the level of authenticity uh, and and you know what kind of responsibility do we play if we publish this and the person turns out not to be who they say they are or, or whatnot, and and usually. I like to think that that comes through. We have enough people. We have we have witnesses and victims and combatants on our editorial staff, on our board that can always kind of, for some of us who who maybe don't have that uh, that firsthand experience, can kind of help be uh, be pointed out that this person is misunderstanding or misusing or something like that. Although I I can probably count on one hand. I don't, maybe not. I don't even need one hand. Maybe one finger at a time that that's ever come up. Mm -hmm. But it's always you know we're always trying to figure out you know is this coming from an authentic perspective? Especially if it is coming from the perspective of a combatant. If it's written in first person and it's 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 supposedly nonfiction, right? Because obviously fiction you can kind of you have a little bit of leeway. It's not purport, purporting itself to be uh, actually experienced or, or possibly true. Um, but it is, it's something that we're, we're always kind of talking about. And, and there are times when we do look into, well, who is this person really? And is it, are, are they, could they possibly be offensive uh, because we're publishing their work and it is supposedly a true account of something or coming from a place of supposed bona fide experience when in fact this person, you know, doesn't actually have that experience. So you know, and I'm more than more that we talk about it, the more that I kind of think of, you know, it, it kind of goes to this whole academic place of, well, what is the purpose of fiction, right? You know, is it to 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 promote imagination and, and thoughts of what could be and, and, and that, you know, or, you know, so is it okay if there is somebody who doesn't have that firsthand experience, but yet writes from uh, as if they do, you know, in nonfiction, it might be different than with fiction because I know there's any number of, uh, you know, writers uh, of fiction who you know, like to imagine themselves uh, as, uh, as somebody or writing from a first person POV that uh, uh, when they, they themselves have never experienced. So it, it gets into tricky things and all what we try to do is just make sure that the, the, the uh, we're being as earnest and as authentic as possible about that process of making sure that the person in themselves is, is reliable in what they say. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And uh, this is sort of a big question. I don't know if you can answer it <laughs> somewhat on the on the spot, but what is a good war story? What is a good war story? So meaning like, uh, what your, is, like what is the criteria? Like what may, I mean, everybody always um, holds up the things they carried as, you know, the, oh, right. like the you know, epitome of a great war story. So um, in your mind, like what are some criteria of a, a story that's related to war, that's related to the consequences of war that is, makes it exactly what you seek in that kind of story? Yeah, no, that is a big question. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate you asking it. I, you know, I think it's something that, you know, you ask me now, I don't have an answer. If you ask me again in a year, I might have a different answer because, you know, what makes for a, a great war story, a good war story, you know, is often informed by what you've already read, right? And it, it's the reason why we have, you know, Kind of go back to the academic side, you know, modernism and postmodernism is because there's this tradition, right, of not only of literature, but specifically for this question, war literature, right? So after a while, those stories, and I'm certainly not seeing, you know, uh, you know, things like Gary is is out of date or anything like that, but there there becomes an accumulation, right, of a certain kind of war story, and so what becomes good, quote unquote, good is often the same thing that ma what makes literature good is that it's doing something a little bit different. And so because, because we've all read, you know, uh, the realism and, 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 and whatnot, and naturalism, and, and you know, you're moving your way through, and we're very familiar with, you know, Madame Bovary style and, and, and this kind of expression of, 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 you know, reality, whatnot. We want to kind of be engaged in different ways. And I think that, that holds true with the, the tradition of war literature. You know, it's not that the, the story, you know, Hemingway and, and whatnot, that they don't have relevance and they're, they're bad in any way, but certainly from somebody who reads uh, literature that discusses war, the effects of war and geopolitical violence on a daily basis, what I am often drawn to is the story, the poem, the, the essay, the translation that gets at some of the ideas in a slightly different way. You know, again, I was kind of talking about, you know, the, the story at the end of 13.1 about the two women being in love. You know, that really kind of, because it, 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 it approaches obliquely the effects of war, the, the psychological, emotional devastation, the geographical divide, things like that, as opposed to, you know, I'm in my foxhole, you know, firing my M16, you know, that's not a bad story. Not by a long shot, but I've read that story so many times. And so there, it, with that story, it has to be doing something. It still has to be doing something different or fresh, you know, because uh, we're looking for ways uh, to engage in conversations that either aren't happening uh, or that need to be revitalized in, in a way. So, you know, a good story for me is one that is uh, that does something maybe a little bit different, but that still has that that timeless authenticity of that experience so so yeah thank you. i'm gonna keep thinking about that though for sure <laughs> i guess yeah sometimes it's easier to sort of address what is a bad war story <laughs> <laughs> usually usually yeah because it's it, that's a little bit easier it's just, you know because a bad you know yes it is, it is. i don't want to <laughs> um, so what do you what uh do you want to see more of in submissions for those uh out there watching and are wondering if their particular piece is something that might be right for this magazine um, are there um, specific things, specific regions of the world, specific conflicts that you want to hear more about, see more of in submissions? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, you know, because we have a, a, feed, a translations feature um, dealing with Korea, uh, you know, people who have work that relates to Korea, translations work specifically that relates to Korea, were absolutely interested in, in, in seeing. But I think also Asia itself, um, is a region, a region, uh, is a you know, continent um, that we're interested in more work from. We don't get a lot of, uh, you know, Asian work um, uh, or, you know, Indo-Asia Indo um, uh, work. You know, that's one of the areas that we're looking to increase our reach towards uh, to, um, you know, so that we can kind of have a little bit more uh, from them. Uh, from those regions. Um, so certainly that, uh, as far as kind of geographically speaking, 
um, you know, from a genre perspective, as kind of Richard was kind of led us to talk about, uh, you know, nonfiction, we're always, you know, looking for more nonfiction um, uh, and, and uh, translations work too. Um, those, those two genres, all, all the genres are vital, uh, but certainly a nonfiction, I think because of the things that we talk about and translations work, uh, they have a kind of a special place for us because they can, uh, they can approach things in a, maybe a more direct way um, than, than, than fiction and poetry. And before I get myself in trouble saying one's like more authentic than the other, and that's absolutely not what I'm saying, but um, you know, they, they, they bring different strengths that we're, we're interested in having more of. So translations work, nonfiction work uh, would certainly be at the top of that. But yeah, geographically speaking, um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the Asian communities, we certainly would love to, to get more work from. That's great. Um, yeah. And you guys have an event coming up with um, in collaboration with a few other war themed magazines. Is that correct? Yeah, that might happen. Oh. Um, there's some there, there's still some dis discussion about that. But but yeah, there was a, a series called Ask an Editor and we were going to work with uh, Collateral and, and Zero Dark Thirty and, and a couple other um, journals that, that have a military focus um, to kind of do a little bit of like what we're doing, but mm -hmm. um, that's still kind of in the works. There's okay. a number of moving pieces. And as I'm sure you know, Becky, it's it, trying to organize things via email uh, is, <laughs> is exceptionally difficult. It's, I don't yeah. know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah, because I know uh, there are some other great magazines too. I remember I actually submitted a piece to War Literature and the Arts and they turned it down and they, they said they liked the piece, but there wasn't enough war in it. So <laughs> interesting to try to, yeah. to find what these places are looking for. Um, and we have one more comment, maybe late for this, but if not another question, have you seen many Latin American submissions, Colombia, Mexico, and the violence of kidnappings, paramilitaries, et cetera? Yeah, no, uh, we have. Um, and in fact, there is a piece that um that we were that we were actually i was just talking about the nonfiction uh, editors about that has that, that had to do with uh kidnappings and whatnot um and some of the, that uh, uh, political violence going on um we have a new board member her name is molly malloy who uh has some experience in working with uh the kind of some of the issues in latin america and certainly with stuff that's going on at the border of the u.s uh, mexico border um and i think that uh, you know we why we do while we do receive some of that work um i, I think that's uh an un and i don't want to make it sound like some kind of promising thing because i know we're talking about suffering here but certainly there are so many incidents and events and situations in central america uh, you know, uh, the Caribbean, whatnot, that um, that we could get a lot more work from them uh, and, and, and would it be unexpected. So, I mean, you know, put that on the list, you know, of uh, places we'd like to see more work from. I mean, that's that's the thing is that we're, we're more narrow in scope, but these things happen so often over so many different places that, you know, um, that there's there's absolutely, unfortunately, no shortage of, of uh, incidents to draw from so so yeah again you know people that uh that write about these things uh you know that happen in latin america these you know being disappeared and, and whatnot um send them send your work our way please um and apart from submitting to the magazine which by the way our submissions open now yeah they're open uh, until april 15th so we have like a three month on three month off three month on so we're open until april 15th off for three months and then back open for another three months. Um, and are there ways for people to get more involved either with the journal or with Consequence Forum? Do you guys need more volunteers, more readers? Um, oh my. How, people, <laughs> how yes. can people get involved? Yeah, no, we're always looking for more hands on deck. Um, we're, right now, if you if you have an interest in working you know, with us, um, you can email me um, at uh, exec, e -X -E -C dot ed at consequenceforum.org. Um, or if you go to our website, there is the general email and you can reach out that way. I, I, I'm on both of those emails pretty much 24 hours a day, so I'll, I'll catch it. Um, but we're always looking for people to help out uh, in, in some way. And, and 
though we don't always have a specific thing that needs to be done, the fact that you want to help usually means that when something comes up, we can we can turn to you to do that. So right now we're we're our editorial staff is at about 20 and it, I don't know how much bigger we're going to make that, but our outreach, our fundraising, our grants team, um, you know, social media team, things like that, those are still growing uh, and still have uh, uh, enough work that we are always kind of having our ears open. Plus, you know, with a volunteer uh, community that we're kind of relying on, you know, people unfortunately have to, you know, they have to work. So they can't always be as available and, and people, you know, help out for a while and then they have to go on to other things. So there's always kind of this sense of, you know, if you want to help out, we would love to talk to you and, and, and see what we can make work for everybody. That's great. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking the time yes. today and people should definitely submit, check out the magazine, go read it, subscribe to it and get more involved. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks thank everyone you. for coming out. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank thank you. you. It was appreciate it was great. Very informative. Thank you very much. Great Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you, Richard. Thank you, Ellen.